Hello and welcome. I'm Bill Bragan. I'm Executive Artistic Director of the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I'm thrilled to welcome you back to the fifth annual edition of the Barzak Festival. I want to start by thanking the Art Center's sustaining sponsor, GSC, as well as our media partners, The National, Al Ittihad, Abu Dhabi World, Yalla Magazines, and Time Out Abu Dhabi. I also want to give a huge thank you to all the staff and all the crew at the Art Center who have worked so hard to reinvent what we do to create an entirely online season. This year, the Barzak Festival celebrates a global vision of Black History Month. On Monday, we opened with a moving program, program called Las Cantoras, in which Afro-Venezuelan singer Betsaida Machado and archivist Osvaldo Lares explored his archives of traditional Venezuelan female singers. It's still online through Monday, so don't miss it. And on Wednesday, we had a powerful concert by Martha Redbone Roots Project, filmed for the Art Center at National Sawdust in Brooklyn. You can find both on the Art Center's YouTube channel. And please subscribe so you can stay updated on live streams and archival events. You can also find us at NYUAD Art Center on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and nyuad-artcenter.org on the web, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter. While you're there, if you've been appreciating what the Art Center has been doing in this year since we've turned online, we ask you to please join us as a member and keep supporting our work. Upcoming at the Art Center, our contemporary Arab film series, Cinema Na, continues this Monday with the screening of the Egyptian film, Between Two Seas. It will be followed by a Q&A with director Anas Tolba, moderated by the Art Center's Rumi Salah. We have lots more cross-cultural dialogues coming up as well, including a recital of American contemporary minimalism by Italian pianist Emanuele Artiuli as part of the Manifold Festival on Friday, February 12th. And then on February 17th, we present a collaboration between the incredible classical Indian Odissi dance company, Nutrigram Dance Ensemble, in collaboration with Sri Lankan candy and dance troupe, Chitrasena Dance Company. And now for tonight's performance. I'm thrilled to present the world premiere of Minarets, a new suite by Kazi Malefi and Boom Duan, created in collaboration with pianist Nduduzo Makatini. Boom Duan's residency is presented with support from the US mission in the UAE. As part of the residency and the Art Center's Off the Stage series, members of the group will lead workshops in the rhythms of the Arabian Sea on February 14th, both sessions in both Arabic and in English, presented in partnership with Ajman University, Zaid University's College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Dubai's al Sarkal Online, and the Russell Haima Fine Arts Festival. I also want to thank Afikra, who hosted a great conversation with Ghazi last week, which will be posted online in the coming weeks. And finally, I want to thank our promotional partners. Check out Jazz from my hometown jazz station, WBGO Jazz 88, and 2.48 AM in Kuwait. I'm now going to welcome to the screen Ghazi Malefi and Nduduzo Makatini. And we'll have a brief introduction before we premiere the performance. Afterwards, there will be a more extensive Q&A. So if you've got any questions or comments, please add them to the chat throughout the program. Or just say hello, send some emoji love, and let us know where you're watching from. Now, please welcome Kalsio Malefi and Nduduzo Makatini. All right, hello, gentlemen. So I want to dive into the music and give people a chance to hear uh, this incredible suite that you've created together. Uh, but just before we get to see you as an ensemble first time, I wanted to take just one moment for you each to just introduce the audience to your own musical practice and kind of where you were coming from and what you brought into the collaboration. Uh, and so I'm going to start, uh, I'll start with uh, Boom Duan's leader, uh, Ghazi Malefi. So Ghazi, if you could just talk for a little bit about, about Boom Duan and what, what the project is for you. Yeah, so uh, thank you for having us, first of all. Thank you to the Arts Center at Nwaya Bulabi. Uh, thank you, Tinduduzo, for being generous uh, enough to collaborate with us. Um, so basically, Boom Diwan is a continuation, uh, a natural organic continuation of my research, uh, which deals with Kuwaiti Bahri music, Kuwaiti music of the sea, Kuwaiti pearl diving music, the music of my ancestors, and on the other end, uh, global jazz, which is a beautiful entryway to dialogue with so many different types of music. So. I'm an applied ethnomusicologist, and I'm very much invested in my own family's uh, Bahri traditions, but also at the same time in, in keeping that tradition living, putting into the dialogue, which is why it has been my great honor to work with my brother, Duduza Makatini from South Africa, and to have a kind of 
communication from ancestor to ancestor, if you will, with jazz being our, our common language. Great. Thank you for that. And Zuduzo, do you want to, uh, I guess, share, share kind of the perspective you're bringing into this? Yeah. Well, I don't think I bring much. I think uh, much of it is really based on like what I think of as like a response to something that's already happening, like from the onset, Brother Kazi brought these themes. And um, I, I kind of feel like I was just responding to those most of the time. But also what really became clear for me was like the beauty in exploring this kind of very alternative way of making music and somehow creating space for a newness, both in the sound, but also you know, in the ways that people can create options in these difficult times to carry on creating. So, you know, my work works around that kind of notion of the communal, which is situated deeply in our cultural context of Ubuntu. And, 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 and that Ubuntu does not just end with the physical dimension, but the more people gather, together in rituals or musical making processes, there is kind of external or invisible presence that uh, also joins in. So I, I kind of felt that a lot throughout the process. And, and, and when the drums came in, it was really something, something beyond words, you know, I, I just, yeah, I just had to just jump in and play. I mean, that was it. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm excited for everybody to hear you jump in and play. And I think you've both just dropped a lot of really great kernels for ideas that hopefully will be resonating in the background as people listen to the music. The piece is about 22, 23 minutes long. Uh, and then afterwards, we're going to invite you both back on the screen and we'll continue our conversation. We'll also be inviting people from the audience to send their questions into the Q&A uh, in the chat on Facebook or YouTube. So so we will consider this a very multidimensional conversation. Uh, so now uh, what we're going to hear is a new three-part suite. It's entitled Minarets. The sections are The Pearl, followed by Blood in the Wind, and then Raise Your Words. And before we, uh, before we hear it, I just want to give a big shout out to the Art Center's Estelle Galloway, the audio engineer, and Harshani. Uh, uh, Karuna Ratna, who's the video editor. They both did an amazing job turning the many recordings filmed in Abu Dhabi, filmed in Kuwait, filmed in South Africa, into the performance you're going to see and hear tonight. So now, please put your hands together for the world premiere of Minarets. Bet <laughs> Rasul Hala bet rasul Makka ya amdin Bet rasul Makka ya amdin Hala bet rasul Makka ya
Raise your words, not your voice. Rain brings flowers, not thunder. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Ah, that was amazing. Uh, 
I'm so proud of uh, the fact that we could premiere this. Uh, but first, I want you to shout out all the other musicians who are on stage with you, uh, as well as some of the people who work with you uh, in Kuwait and uh, South Africa to make that happen. Yeah, of course. So um, uh, in Kuwait, we have Abdul Aziz Al Hamili, uh, Abdul Wahab Al Hamili, uh, Khalid Bunashi, uh, Hamid Al Saeed. Uh, Amin Farid Abdal, um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was an amazing um, amazing group of people that made it all happen. So that's uh, on my end in Kuwait, and of course, of course, here in Abu Dhabi, uh, Claude Cousins on drums and Stephen Bedford on the bass guitar. Yeah. Great. And uh, and Ndaduza, who worked with you to film that? It, was, it looked inside it beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. Actually, he happens to be here with me. Ndumiso uh, Mjali did the video recordings, but he's too shy. He's not going to come on the screen. <laughs> and <laughs> we had Jonathan that worked with another sound engineer, but we are really thankful to the Guild Theatre here in South Africa, in East London. It's a beautiful place and, and they have a beautiful piano. So we were on that and they did all uh, the, gave us the venue and there was beautiful lighting already there. And yeah, truly special. Yeah, well, it, it came off great. And again, big thanks to Estelle Galloway and Harshani. Uh, Pruna Ratna, who put it together sonically and visually. Uh, I want to now talk a little bit, I guess, first, uh, first, we'll just start with a little bit of the larger conception. You know, Ghazi, you talked about Boom Duan and sort of the essence of that with the boom as the name of the Tao, which goes out to search for pearls. It's the expedition, the Diwan, the Diwaniya, or here in the UAE, the Modulus, which is a place that you receive guests. Uh, I want to first actually uh, make a connection that I didn't actually make until today, which is uh, one of the reasons why Duduzo is part of this project. I was brainstorming with a friend of mine, uh, Bryce Rosenblum, who runs uh, New York Winter Jazz Fest, among any other, many other things. And his, his company is actually the Boom Collective. So it's actually really appropriate that, uh, that he brought us all together. Uh, and we've talked a lot, Ghazi, about the fact that the Bahari tradition is cosmo cosmopolitan music. It's music of dialogue and exchange. And this is a theme that's actually really prevalent in both of your work. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how you each work sort of across cultures and musical idioms and how you, how you bring it all together. Yeah, uh, um, thank you for that. Before I do that, I just want to make sure that I mentioned uh, Ghanim Salim and Khalid Banashi. I may or may not have, but I just want to err on the side of caution for doing that. Um, so uh, how do we engage with the, the tradition and respect it and give it a place to breathe and be alive today? So, so I, I think I think about this in very simple terms and, and in some ways, in most ways, there's nothing new about them. And um, when I think about Kuwaiti Bahri music, uh, Kuwaiti pearl diving music, Kuwaiti music of sea and trade. I think about music that is that is extra Arabic, extra Khaliji, um, that is born of the engagement with the other for the need of survival. And very briefly, during the days of pearl diving in Kuwait, where the pearl was the main economic resource, fresh water to drink had to be imported. There was nothing besides the pearl and the caravan trade in the desert. So in order for Kuwaitis to survive, they had to engage with uh, the people of Northeastern Africa, Zanzibar, Mombasa, and throughout South Asia. And of course, we exchanged economically, but where we really gained was in this human connection, this communal connection, the cultural, the the real, the real, the real connection to survive. So, when when Kuwait became a state in 1961, and uh, you know there was the discovery of oil, and that's a great thing because many people could live better lives and so on. This music kind of took on a space of um, being a symbol of uh, you know like an act of heritage, cultural production, and so on. 
And there's a space for that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But as as somebody who is among the last a descendant of the among the last three families still practicing pearl diving in Kuwait, I feel like this tradition of exchange and change and music that changed with every season, uh, fluidity, dialogue, openness, uh, playfulness. Uh, situated in deep spirituality. This is something that, this is what I feel like I want to take care of. And what I feel, you know, what I'm doing with Brother Nduduzo today, who's also a very uh, spiritual person connected to his own ancestry, is, is engaging in a playful way, but in a spiritual way. But all this is, is giving a nod to a tradition that already exists that that I don't want to be forgotten. So that is that is the mission of Boom Diwan is to is to travel as the sailing ships traveled, but also as to open up uh, the Diwan, which is the place where we receive people in our homes, to have conversations and to understand each other. Great. And and to do so, how does that resonate with sort of your own background? I know you grew up, you played in a church context, you kind of worked in jazz, you then started really exploring Zulu cultural traditions and, and the spirituality is such an important part of your own music. So tell me a little bit about, about sort of your perspective as you started coming into this musical space. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm truly just thankful to have been involved. And I, I think more than anything, it's like, this notion of rivers and where they meet. And for me, that's really what comes forward is this, because um, in, in, in um, a lot of traditions, all kinds of music emerges out, out of a cosmological standpoint, a way of being in the world. And something beautiful when these rivers kind of meet that happens, I think for me is what I would like to think of as improvisation and as, this kind of notion that uh, allows us to be vulnerable outside of this kind of knowing, outside of these contexts. So for me, really the beauty is right at, the, at that middle kind of place where it, is, it matters so much for me to be coming out of a particular heritage and a particular culture, but also when I get to a point where I can dissolve that within, within other cultures. You know, um, there is uh, this notion of the liminality as this space of in-betweenness. Mm -hmm. And um, in the way that I was feeling throughout this music, I was feeling this kind of in-betweenness. There's one of the themes that really goes into this deep kind of blues feeling, which I always feel like this blues feeling is like the kind of DNA, this kind of collective memory. And there's a way in which like, when I hear that kind of spirit, it's like, it's almost like sounding from a distance, but yet coming from deep within. So there is a way in which like being in this project has evoked all these kinds of different feelings for me, being situated in, in the cultural context, but what does it mean to expand those contexts and create space for dialogue with other contexts and with, with other ways of knowing. So I think um, I feel a lot of plurality, if I may, in this sound, in, in, a, in a sense that it's situated within a particular culture, but this culture in itself is so kind to allow other articulations to, to matter within those cultural frames. So it's a beautiful way, a democratic way of, of, of music making, and I'm thankful for it. Great, and I, I love I love the way that you brought in sort of the the metaphor of the rivers and the liminality, which actually you know, speaks directly to the Barzakh festival and why we named it Barzakh to begin with, because it is that space and that idea, which I think really came across in the collaboration, that all of those different properties and those elements 
were there and they were meeting uh, and they were present all at the same time uh, and not diluted, right? Like you just, you felt all of the components. Uh, and I think it's important, you know, often when I'm talking about the festival, I do talk about it from this sort of more secular meaning, uh, but there is also, a, there's also a spiritual meaning to Barta. And I think that you also, uh, I think you both really captured that in terms of the spiritual dimension of what's happening in the music. Uh, and I want, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back to that uh, in a little bit. But one of the things that struck me at first uh, is the affection between both of you, right? Like there is such an incredible rapport and this sense of brotherhood and this sense of uh, just watching you two kind of in the Zoom, watching this show together and seeing the joy. Uh, and what struck me is you've never been in the same room together in in physical person, right? This entire collaboration was born on Zoom. It started in a post-COVID time. So I'm wondering how, like, how did you create this rapport? How did you come together and get to know each other and create this dialogue, which is such an important word to Ghazi whenever he talks about music? How did you how did you find that with one another through this process? Oh man, that's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was very organic um, and I, I can't explain why, to be honest with you, I really can't. But all I can tell you is whenever uh, I was having uh, conversations with my brother and Deduzo on Zoom, I found myself sharing very, um, very vulnerable emotions of things that I wanted to process uh, musically, which we, which we did together. And I feel that some of those things resonated with him. I could feel it. I'm not sure if that's, uh, yeah. you know, of course, man. <laughs> and so, so these resonances, you know, were reflected in our collaboration. So the why, I don't know the why, but, uh, there was just something very, I don't know. It just felt like whenever we talked, there was no talking about the weather. There was just talking about really honestly uh, vulnerable and spiritual things that we were thinking through together, whether they were about connection, uh, about uh, colonial histories, yeah. about uh, pain, about healing about coming together. And one of the words that kept coming up over and over again was about a refusal. Yeah. Refusing, refusing this forced disconnection that the spirit needs to speak and it needs to connect with other spirits. So I don't know why or how, but I know, I know that there was some there there and it happened and I don't think a part of me, if you want to know the, the God's honest truth, a part of me really believes that there's something that's beyond the Deduzo and I that, that happened, that we were, I hope, a, a vessel for. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you brought up that idea of the refusal, because I noticed at some point in the past couple of days, as you were like, as we were all circling all these Insta Instagram stories around, at some point you posted a photo and you just kind of captured, you captioned it in Instagram story, the refusal. So I'm wondering if you could both talk to me a little bit more about, the, about that conversation and to do so. When, when Ghazi is talking about that, what does the refusal mean to you? So, um, you know, part of, of this being in this moment, this time space, uh, period around the world is beyond the impacts that all of this has been having on our health and losing loved ones. But there is a way in which it also equally disturbs ways of being and ways of responding and, 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 and put in a position of kind of like disarmed in a sense, like this feeling of, oh, well, there is nothing I can do. So the, 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 similar to how I was supposed to fly into Dubai and, and perform this concert, but this refusal, even if that didn't happen, but there has to be a, a way in which this message is still you know, sent out. So 
I think the, re the refusal happens in this, what I really call in my work, this break, you know, that like music really happens at this point when something breaks. So, you know, I always speak about the breaking into sound. So in a sense, suggesting that there's always something that precedes the sound. So if we were to look at the sounds that are refusing not to be heard, the sounds that want to be heard. Um, and I, I think this is how this notion came in quite strong in, in our thinking in saying that, you know, man, because most of it in our rehearsals, which we were doing on Zoom, we had conversations and Brother Gazi would always have his guitar and he plays something that we play. Of course, there was problems with latency and stuff and we kind of just sense where each other was at. But again, those are all the different modes of refusal, you know, towards this break, you know. So, 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 so sound as something that really has to break a particular boundary before it, it, it manifests in sonic ways. So the refusal is always there with the sound, I guess. I mean, if you think about notions of displacement, you think about pre-colonial and colonial histories, there is always a way in which sound then became that force that was creating an option, you know? So sound has always been central in creating options. And sound has always been, and music has always been a part of the pearl diving tradition, which I think even within the Gulf is not very well known. It's certainly much lesser known outside of the Gulf. Uh, and one of the things that when I first heard uh, Mayuf Majali and I heard the traditional Fakhri music uh, was learning about the essential role of the Naham, the song leader, and the different kinds of repertoires, the spiritual repertoire for protection, the work songs, the songs for entertainment when you're in the port. Uh, and there was a question from the audience, uh, one of the viewers asked about the songs uh, at the beginning and what is the value to the sailor. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of the Naham, uh, which starts with Aziz Hameli and then is followed by you answering later and Duzo kind of enters as a sort of Naham. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the voice and the text and the songs and, uh, and how they propelled the piece forward. Yeah, so um, in, in the days of pearl diving in Kuwait, one of the highest paid members of the ship uh, was called the Naham. And the Naham, and there's, usually, there's usually more than one, there's usually two. Uh, and the Naham was somebody who um, sang uh, commands to the sailors. So if it was time to uh, to raise a sail, the Nukhada, the captain, would tell to the Naham, say to the Naham, Idrab Salli, which does not mean raise the sail, it means something else. And the Naham would start singing a spiritual. But that spiritual meant to the pearl divers, it was time to raise the sail. So when he says, or, or, or draw an anchor, whatever it was. So <laughs> this particular one is, uh, it just says, Beit Rasul Makka Yamdina. So it just says, the home of the Prophet is in Mecca, and he's speaking to the city of Medina. And so that's the literal meaning of this, of this phrase. But the, the meaning that I interpret, the spiritual meaning of this is, about orientation you know as muslims when we pray we face mecca so we face ourselves to this direction physically but it's also a, a spiritual orientation and it's a metaphor for a certain kind of work right and this work can take many forms and in our case it's music making so in order to play music from the right space you have to orient yourself in the right direction and so and so the nahams effectiveness had nothing to do with the beauty of his voice at all. It had to do with the honesty in his voice. The more honest he was in embodying the pain of the crew and giving it back to them with his voice, the more effective he was at healing them enough to be able to continue to do their work. So then Aham's role is a singer, but he's really a healer. And he has to choose the right poem, the right disposition, and the right orientation, which is why for the pearl, I, I chose that, that phrase, Beta Rasul Makkah I'm doing it, because it's all about this orientation. 
and, and we can take this metaphor in, in so many different directions, but that's that's the reason why, yes. And in that extended call and response, at the end of the piece, before you go into the gorgeous uh, piano coda, the, the solo, and do so you, you then respond with the song as well. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you were singing and what, what inspired you to bring that into the piece? Yeah. So um, part of like trying to um, create of what could be thought, as, thought of as like rehearsals, which in essence is, you know, for me, I see it as meditations in many ways. What really became evident quite early in our conversations was the relationships, the things that invoked something within my kind of like musical memory that's from upbringing and stuff. And um, so there is a way in which then we start thinking of scales as as access to ancient moments, particular, you know, histories. So when one of the, 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 the songs was playing, I started hearing um, what we call the Psalms here in South Africa, Mahubo, which is a traditional Zulu music style that is kind of based on a Lydian mode. And most of these songs, they really refer to the notions of God. So the story goes that like, the, the African construct a God was really based on watching and observing the universe every day and, and, and thinking there must be someone responsible for all of this beauty. So it did not really come out as this like kind of like a physical kind of idea of a God, but it was like, if there's so much beauty in the world, there has to be someone responsible for all of this. So in a way, these songs were seen to be ways of speaking to two paradigms. On the one hand, the universe, nature, and all that was, was around us, and the, and the forces that govern all of it, that are beyond, that are invisible. So what I'm saying in that part of the song is, meaning there is something that governs, in, that governs all of it. And then it says as well, if we were looking for healing, then it's like about, again, what Brother Gazi calls the orientation. And in the Zulu orientation, it's looking to the sky because Zulu in itself as a word means the sky, or it also translates the heaven. So orientation again becomes this part of articulating this prayer, this notion of a prayer. And, and I, I without even knowing what the story in the scales and in the sounds and sounds as these expressions, as these gestures that are codes in themselves to particular ancient times. So in, the, in that idea of orientation, uh, I guess it, it sort of brings it back to the, the title of the suite itself called Minarets, which really I think captures a lot, a lot of those themes. Uh, and Gazi talked about the first section, the pearl, uh, but then there's a shift. There's a, there's a huge tonal shift with Blood and the Wind, and it gets you know, much darker, more perilous. Uh, so perilous, you might lose your pick while you're playing. Uh, you know, and then and then it and then it sort of resolves with raise your words. If you can talk a little bit about the about the overall sort of structure and the arc compositionally of that, uh, I'm also going to start bringing in some other questions. We're getting some great questions in from uh, from the chat on Facebook and YouTube. So keep sending those through, uh, and I'm going to start pulling in some of the some of the viewers' questions as well. But now let's start. Let's start talk a little bit about minarets and that title, and then about the, the arc of the piece. Yeah. So I'll start about the arc of the piece first, and then I'll talk about the minarets. So in the beginning, there was no arc of the piece. There were three conversations that Brother Indudus and I were having. One was about orientation. One was about uh, blood in the wind, which has to do with giving voice to senseless violence and suffering and raising your words, which has to do with um, grace and forgiveness. And it's based on a, on a Rumi uh, poem. Um, so, uh, so we had these, we had these concepts and we started working on this music, but, um, 
the Ark came after, because in the initially it was a different order, and uh, and honestly, you know, Bill was in conversations with you and Duzo and Claude and Stephen that we thought that the Ark. I had it originally ending with Blood in the Wind, which ended in a moment of violence, where we thought, you know, we thought better of it after we we had a conversation about it, and um, you know, honestly, at your suggestion of thinking about what are we leaving the audience with, and it made a lot more sense to leave them with a sense of grace, and and as Brother Stephen says, it felt way more like a story, which resonated with everybody else uh, in that conversation, so. The Pearl, we've talked about that concept, you know, it's about the orientation. Blood in the Wind, Brother Ndudu's and I were talking and I said, you know, they're, you know, geographically where I am, whether it's in Kuwait or in the, in the United Arab Emirates where I am now, uh, I live in relative peace, you know, I'm very, very safe, I have no worries for my family and safety of my friends, but in geographic areas not so far from me, there's a lot of people suffering for no good reason, no reason at all. So I started talking to Brother Ndaduza saying, well, I can't change that, but I think it's important to, to take a moment and, and give that pain voice to express that somehow. And Brother Ndaduza said, you know, with all the, the loss of life due to the pandemic and the, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, the notions of I can't breathe came up, which you can't really hear me saying in part of the solo, but it kind of comes up. That, that that part of the the suite was about acknowledging a multitude of pain globally and and expressing that pain. Uh, do you want to say something about that, Brother Ndeduzo? Yeah, I, I think when we th there was a point where we, we, we spoke about the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement and most in particular the story of George Floyd and, and this notion of I can breathe. But, but, but then we started discussing the fact that, you know, when that particular moment happened, uh, I started, because I watched the video so many times of the George Floyd story. And, and, and then like I was saying that it started to occur to my spirit that there's always a difference when someone tries to kill your body, right? That's one dimension, that's what's been happening the transatlantic narrative, the colonial apartheid and all of that has been like a series of catastrophes when bodies were humiliated, right? But then there is a different shift with the, this notion of I can breathe, where it becomes clear that part of these killings intends to kill something deeper than the body stuff. It intends to kill the very construct that completes the being. So in, in African traditions here, we see being as in three dimensions. We speak about the living, we speak about the living dead, which is a register of the ancestors. We speak about the ones to be born. And, and, and so in that way, our view is that of immortality. So we go through these circles and come back, right? But it kind of filled with, I can breathe, there was a feeling of maybe even these connections to immortality are being tampered with in this moment. And therefore blood in the wind as an acknowledgement of the spiritual aspects too, using blood perhaps as a metaphor to think about what flows in the air too, when we lose all of these lives. And what are some of the ways to be cognizant, not only about the bodies and numbers, but what happens to the soul, you know? So, so I just wanted to add that because I think it, it just like when it goes to the blues section and again, we're thinking about this notion of work songs and all of these kind of repertoires that come out of this seeking and looking for this utopian place. And, 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 and the George Floyd incident for me connects quite a lot with this piece as a response that we see your body that's been killed, but we also see your spirit that is wandering and, and the difficulty that the spirit and the soul has to also go through beyond the body. And so out of this, this movement that is born of extreme violence and is, you know, is really kind of contending with all of that, uh, 
you're finding this this kernel of hopefulness and transformation, which then expresses itself in raise your words. Uh, so, tell me about that transition and about about the Rumi poem that you were kind of drawing from and, and what you were thinking about as you decided to set that text. Yeah, I, th I think this part was one of the first parts that you shared with Brother Deduzo, and um, you know, I was. I was, I think, enraged with the same kinds of senseless violence that Brother Ndudusa was talking about. And I really found myself extremely angry and enraged. And um, I happened upon this, this poem and this line that says, raise your words, not your voice. It's rain, uh, it's rain that brings flowers, not thunder. Right? And this idea of of, of rain and water, you know, being this calming and healing and uh, forgiving uh, space and that we need to give voice to the rage in blood in the wind, but that can't be the end of the story. At the end of the day, we need to find this grace. And this goes back to orientation. You know, it goes back to the sense of, um, understanding that this rage is really sadness and that and that grace will bring a kind of healing and that the right orientation will bring a kind of healing but that all of this is requires intentionality because it's it's not easy yeah. all right well thank you for that the I think the power of the piece really comes across and the, and the kind of emotional arc and the spiritual arc and the musical arc is so clear. Uh, and the fact that uh, it was assembled the way that it was in three different countries on different days uh, with, uh, I guess, Ndudzo, you and Claude Cousins, the drummer, had known each other like 20 some odd years ago in university together, but he's been living in Abu Dhabi. Steve Bedford is in Dubai. He has never played like the trio who are based here with, with him and Ghazi and Claude have never actually played together until, until we were recording. And a number of the people in the chat are just uh, first praising how seamless it was and how it felt like you were all in a room together. Uh, but a couple of people were remarking on how difficult it looks to diffuse and, and just are curious a little bit about how it all came together. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so if you could just talk a little bit about uh, about sort of the process of now you've conceptually came up with a piece. Now, how do, how do you turn it into this incredible concert that we saw tonight? Oh man! So, based on my conversations with Brother Deduzo, I um, I just created these really um, broad brushstrokes of you know impressionistic feelings to these Kuwaiti rhythms. And it was just some guitar to these Kuwaiti percussion rhythms. And I sent them to him and I asked him to give his, you know, response to them. And, you know, there was this pressure of this recording and all these things. And he says, well, why don't you guys, you know, why don't you guys record first? And I was like, well, <laughs> well why don't you record first? <laughs> And he was gracious enough to, uh, you know, to put himself out there. So but what happened was, is I recorded these sketches and I had kind of like a, a basic form, a basic, a very vague, actually, skeleton. And I sent it to Brother Deduzo and we had a few discussions and, you know, we're both, we're both fathers and we were both exhausted and it was very late in the night and he messaged me was like, hey, you know, if you happen to be awake, man. and I was in bed, and I got out of bed, and I came, sat down in the sea, and we stayed up for hours, and, and we figured some things out. And then uh, and that recording was then, I received it the night before we were in the Black Box Theater when I met with Claude and Brother Steven, and it's the first time that I ever played music with them live. And so it was the rehearsal and the recording that day. And uh, the God's honest truth is, as I was listening to the guide track that Brother Deduzo played, that also included my original guitar take that I was playing on top of and around at the same time, I was reacting to the transitions of the piece as it was happening in my, in my headphones with musicians that I had never 
None of us had played together. We were all in this moment of suspension. And speaking of sound breaking, and speaking of improvisation, and speaking of uh, orientation, had we not been open and kind of, you know, in pearl diving, when you're, when you're opening up the oysters and trying to find an oyster, trying to find a pearl, they say, Safiniya, you have to clear your intention to find the pearl. So we had to find a way to clear our intention, and we were, I was terrified. I'm not going to lie, I was terrified. <laughs> but, uh, but it went well, right? So from then, we, we took that recording and sent it to Kuwait, and my brothers in Kuwait recorded it. Uh, brother Amin, uh, Farid Abdal did the pr whole production with my with my brothers there, and we brought that back to Abu Dhabi. Then sent that to Brother Ndaduzo. He was supposed to fly to Johannesburg, and there's a lockdown, and he has to find the theater. So he goes to the Guild Theater in East London, and we don't know each other. He's fronting all kinds of money to make this production happen, and I mean the whole thing was a huge act of trust. It was a huge yeah. act of trust. Yeah. Every step of the way of this project was based on trust yeah. and yeah. with the sense that there is no floor between your feet, if I can quote my brother Arturo Ferro. And that's I think that's why that's why it stood. But there was no there was there was no real plan. It was just happening. I don't know. Brother and Dudu, so what, what 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 could you say? Man, I think trust comes to the fore in a big way. It's, it's like and also like trust as imagining in the sound itself. It's like, cause that's really the only way we know each other. So somehow in the sound, that level of trust is already captured. It's like, you know, the, the, the sense of warmth and, you know, and I felt this throughout the process, you know, when I got the files and brother Steven and brother Claude and you were playing and the Picasso, and I was just like, man, what do they really want me to do? Cause this sounds like a finished product. What, <laughs> what is it that I can do? <laughs> I remember saying that with the brother Dumiso when he was recording me like on video, I'm like, what do they want me to do? <laughs> so it was really a beautiful process, you know? And, you know, I can't wait to do it again. Yes, and you know, you keep, I just need to say this, you keep downplaying your participation. And I think that is a huge <laughs> injustice. And uh, wow, what an honor it is to really, I really, really, really have to say this. What an honor it is to to play music with you and to, it was deep, man, it's deep. And you, you, you know, all of us, all of us have a hand in this. And I just want to, I want to thank everybody, but I also really want to thank you, Brother Deduza, because this was this was a deep act of trust for no good reason, you know. I... <laughs> hey, Amen. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. And and of course, the the mixing of it makes all of us sound even better. You know, it's just like, man, we were just commenting about that right now. It's like so all of these layers, man, of contributions. It's like everyone was just giving their hearts. You know, you know the sister that was mixing. I'm saying. Shout out to Sister Estelle, man. That's the only reason we. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, I, and I have to say that what I love is the the fact that even listening, I could hear you and Deduzo sort of playing off against some of guys' guitar solos, and I could see you sort of like challenging him and teasing him as if you were on stage together. <laughs> and I can't wait to be able to take this to the next level where you're actually playing music in the same room at the same time. So uh, this is just a beginning, but a really what an auspicious beginning. What a great reward uh, to our trust in bringing two artists together who were strangers to one another and who are now brothers uh, and have created such a beautiful suite and an incredible contribution, honestly, I think, to the world of music, bringing together traditions that have not met before in a knowing way. Uh, and I can't wait to be able to do more with it. So I just wanna thank both of you, I want to thank all the percussionists in Kuwait. I want to thank Stephen and Claude and everybody in the Art Center who's staff who really uh, all worked so hard to bring this together. I want to thank everybody who's watching. This is the, uh, the final night of the Barstak Festival. Uh, and I'm so proud that we were actually able to present this festival in a brand new way in ways that, uh, that we had no idea. So I thank uh, 
everybody who works with me for trusting uh, trusting my insistence that we keep pushing forward uh, even in this uh, period of disorientation and reorientation. Uh, and I invite everybody who's watching to come back to more film screenings and recitals and dance performances and workshops. Uh, Ghazi is going to be leading two workshops, one in English, one in Arabic, on the music of the Arabian Sea on the 14th with support from the US Embassy. And so we hope you will come back to that. And you can find this, this, was, this is gonna stay online. You can find lots of other performances from our archives on our YouTube channel. So we hope you keep coming back to it. Please share it with friends. We really want, to, we want more and more people to hear what is happening uh, in this corner of the planet. And, uh, and thank you both uh, for a really great gift tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you. Listen to Martin Deluso's music. He's got great music. Check it out. Yes, check <laughs> out Deluso's music for sure. All right. Thank you all and good night. Much love.